Well, good morning, Bono First Baptist. I wanted to take a few moments to just share some things with you. As you can see, behind me is the wall of the Temple Mount. Now, this is an amazing thing here because if you look and you see all these rocks, some of these rocks are over 500 tons. And it's an amazing thing. But I want you to see the Temple Mound behind me. And then I want you to see the rocks that are below me. And actually, you can see I am standing on one. And here's the great thing about this. These rocks where my hand is right here are the actual rocks that the temple was made of after, you know, when it was uh, made, then the Romans came in, they destroyed it. And so what they would do is they would take all these huge boulders and they just pushed them over on top of one another on the temple mound and the rocks are still here today. And it reminds me of the scripture when Jesus said, not one of these stones is gonna be left unturned. And it was talking about the temple then. And then we look at here and if you look at all these stones around me, these are the stones that made the temple of God. And not one of them, after Jesus said this was going to happen, not one of them, not one stone was left unturned. You know, that's an amazing thing. They're trying to work it out where they can build the temple yet again. But yet we see here that when Jesus says something and God's word comes to life, it comes to life where you absolutely understand it. And I want you to see where these stones came from way up there. That's where the temple was. And then they just pushed them over and they fell all the way down beside the uh, Temple Mount uh, wall. And here the temple lies in ruins. That's an amazing thing. But here's the thing. When Jesus says, I love you, and he becomes the cornerstone of our life, there is nothing that can ever, ever tear down the temple of God in your heart when the Holy Spirit resides in you. And folks, your life may feel like it's being tumbled up and down. And you may feel like these stones, like the temple was right now, just flipped over and over. But when Christ is in your life, you will never ever be like these stones because nothing will prevail against you when Jesus is for you. I pray that you're having a good day and I will talk with you soon. Goodbye. Seeing the Temple Mound and I remember the first time I went, I saw those stones and the person who I was with didn't show us these stones. And then the second time I went, we had a different, probably the best speaker and guide in all of Israel. I asked him, I said, brother, what are those stones? He goes, oh, oh, brother, we're getting there. We're getting there. And it's one of those days where you're walking five miles in a day. As you can see, I do that quite often. It was at the end of the day, and I just made that video this last time I went last year. I'll be going again in a few years. I pray you go with me. And I remember being breathless. But I remember I had to take that video because I asked him, I said, what, what are these stones? Brother, these were the outer stones for the temple. I said, the temple, the second temple, the Romans destroyed? He said, yes. He goes, these are the stones. Someday they're going to rebuild them. They'll probably come and try to use some of these stones. I said, really? That's interesting. And he made this comment. He said, brother, when they do it, he goes, we won't be here. I was struck in awe. Because see, Jesus said, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. He said it. They heard it. And then they saw it. I just stood there in amazement. I remember the first time I'd ever felt that kind of awe in my life. I was a young man. And I went to Washington, D.C. for the first time. And I remember those were the tallest buildings I'd ever seen as far as the girth. Not just the height, but the girth of them. And I remember walking down the street, and I was thinking, man, look at the architecture. I, I'm not thrilled over architecture. I remember walking down and looking, man, look at the cathedrals. Look at the, the arches in it. I, I'm not into arches and cathedrals. I was a young guy. But it was so awestruck and overwhelming, I was just amazed. The White House compelled, in comparison 
to just the standard buildings on the streets that were just, to me, ominous. And I remember thinking to myself, there are people in this world right now, and that was just a young man, wasn't really watching the news then, wanting to destroy every one of these buildings. And it wouldn't take but one particular type of bomb or explosion to tumble every one of these walls. But see, Jesus said it in words. And he said it because the truth had to be known. Listen to this quote. If it can be destroyed by truth, it deserves to be destroyed by the truth. Do you get that? Let me read that to you again. If it can be destroyed by the truth, it deserves to be destroyed by the truth. This great temple we're going to be talking about today, the truth is, was full of hatefulness and sin inside. And Jesus was the truth bearer. And as great as the world thought it was to see this ominous, overwhelming temple, the truth would destroy it. If you're willing, I'm going to ask that you would stand this morning as we read God's Word. Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 10, Jesus left the temple and was going away. And when his disciples came to point out to him the building of the temple, but he answered them, you see all these? Do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Let us pray, Father, as we come to your holy time of worship. I ask that we would come to you in a time that is desperately needed. For in this world, many look at buildings of power and the people that work within them and give them stature they do not deserve. Not realizing that we as the Christians are the greatest building that was ever made. The blocks of your holy temple. Let us see the worth not in us as our flesh, but as in you that dwells within our soul. And how precious we are in your sight. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. So I want you to look at this. If we go back to verse number one, it says Jesus left the temple and was going away. He'd already been to the temple many times. But this time he goes to the temple and he turns his back on the temple. And he's going away from the temple because he knew he would never ever come back. He was never coming back to the temple because he knew the temple had lost everything that it stood for. Jesus never returns back. Because he realizes it is not standing for the purpose that God had intended. See in Hosea 9.12 it says, Even if they bring up children, I will bereave them till none is left. Bereave here meaning be deprived of a loved one through a profound absence. Especially due to the loved one's death. Here Jesus is going to walk away and in his heart is gut-wrenching. Because he realizes that even though these people that are in the temple that are trying to say they are godly and holy men, he realizes that they are never probably going to take the step of professing him as Lord and Savior. I'm sure it saddens him for those men that were there just as it saddens those or him for those that are not here today. goes on in Hosea to say, woe, woe here mean great sorrow or distress to them when I depart. Jesus, when he departs, there is going to come a day, folks, I want you to hear me. There's going to come a day where Jesus is going to come back. There'll be the rapture where we go to him and then there'll be the second coming. You're going to be hearing a little bit about that over the next couple of weeks. I encourage you not to miss. We're actually going to be talking about a little bit of the end times to come. But there's going to come a time when there is no more chances. 
For many of you here today, whether you're in the parking lot or online or in this room, this could be your last chance to ever hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your A day, your A hour, your A minute are not promised. And when there's a departure of the Lord, there is no coming back. Because there are no more second chances. Jeremiah 6, 8 says, oh, be warned. Jerusalem, he's talking to God's people here. He says, lest I turn from you in disgust, lest I make you a desolation, an uninhabited land. Jesus is here. He sees the temple. And so many are coming to worship, not God, but the temple. They've lost their way. They've lost their walk of faith. They lost the path. God tells us in the very beginning of his word that I will turn and I will be left in disgust. He goes, I will leave you in disgust, meaning a feeling of revulsion, of strong disapproval. He goes on, this is very harsh, a place of desolation, a state of destruction. Not just in the physical or not just in the building, but also in the soul and in the spirit. An uninhabited land not occupied or lived by in or with people. Folks, can you imagine our Father in heaven looking when we get to the gates, when it comes that great time of a reward that he has had for us, something that he wants to give us, something that he has a preposes, preposes to set us on high, to share the throne, and then he looks to you and turns his head and says, flee from me, you iniquities of sin. I never knew you. He says, you disgust me. You're in a state of destruction, of desolation that you never allowed me to repair. Your heart is a land that I cannot habitate in. Can you imagine that? When we look at this very first verse of verse 24, eight words, Jesus left the temple and he was going away. They never realized him walking away from the temple is an example of how he will walk away from us when we don't accept him. Have you allowed him Jesus Christ to walk away from you in your life it can only happen so many times before there are no more walk away it can only happen so many times before your chances are over because no matter how beautifully great the outside is what matters is the inside look at the second part of verse 1 it says when the disciples came to a point came to point out to him the building of the temple. He's walking away and his head's probably down like this. The, the disciples can see Jesus and, and they're like, wow, he doesn't seem to be overwhelmed. They, they don't get to see buildings like this often. It would still rival and magnificent the buildings we have of today. And they're going, hey, Jesus. Hey, hey, Jesus. J Jesus, look, look at the temple. Isn't that something? We're not even allowed to go in the Holy of Holies. Look how great this is. Look how outstanding. Wow. Wow. I remember when I went to Washington, D.C. as a young child, actually a young man, and I remember walking down the streets, and I remember seeing the pavilions and the statues and the cherry blossoms, and I'm a kid, and I'm noticing trees with flowers, and I'm overwhelmed. Folks, I'm a guy. Most guys aren't overwhelmed by that. It was just that amazing. And I remember going, ah, oh, and I can see and feel what these disciples are doing right now. They're on the temple mound. These stones covered in plaster. There's gold and there's omnis everywhere. And they're saying, Jesus, this must be like heaven. Look how beautiful. Jesus was more impressed with the temples in their heart. than the temples of the world. Folks, I promise you, as great as this facility is that God allows us 
to worship in this morning, if something were to ever happen to this, we would meet outside every Sunday in front of the oak tree. Because the most beautiful temple that we have at First Baptist Church Barnwell are the stones sitting in the pews. Luke 645 says, the good person out of the good treasure of heart produces good. And the evil person out of the evil treasure produces evil. For out of abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. See, Jesus could see the hearts of the people running the temple. And it was not a godly thing. It was a horrible thing in his sight. And he could see that through their hearts and what they were saying and what they were allowing to happen and their demeanors that their hearts were not with God because of the words and actions that they were living out. 1 Samuel 16, 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not a man's, what a man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. That's one of the most beautiful verses in the world. When I was a youth pastor, I used it often with young girls. You may find this hard to believe, but for some odd reason, young girls in this world, and I'm not sure if they still do it today, but they'll look in the mirror and they'll see the value of their worth by what they see here and not what they know here. If they don't see as beautiful as what they see in the magazines or what they see on Instagram or Facebook or in the movies, then they don't see their self-worth because they're not as pretty. Now here's the thing, guys do it too. And I always love to remind the youth as I'm reminding the adults that are sitting here today, God sees your value in the heart that he has indwelled in your chest and your soul. Good looks come and go. Even mine will leave someday. My wife is blessed. I'm taking you out to lunch. Winky's taking Liam. Folks, I want you to hear me this morning. If you ever need encouragement and to find the beauty of your life, remember the Lord sees your heart, so make sure he sees something of value. Jeremiah 17.10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. This includes your thoughts. He's not only looking in your minds and your hearts, he's looking at your thoughts. Well, I'm not hurting anyone else. It's just the thought. God sees the thought. And we look and say, why am, I, why am I, or why am I family, or why is it my job, or why are my relationships being as blessed as such and such? And God says, you are blessed by the fruits of your deeds because I have tested your mind and I have searched your heart and I see how you live, outwardly and inwardly. Here Jesus goes and the disciples are looking at this temple and they can't imagine something so beautiful. And God has already seen it, the inside and out. He has already judged it. The sun has already come and he has departed and he doesn't want any part of it. Can you imagine Jesus doing that with you, your sons or your daughters. First Samuel 4, 21a says, And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel. Basically, we see that the temple's name now could be Ichabod because the glory is going to be gone. As Ichabod is a Hebrew origin, meaning the glory is gone. Have you ever felt like the glory has been released from you? Have you ever felt like it just wasn't worth it? Maybe you haven't heard it in a while, and maybe you need to hear it this morning. But you're worth it. And the glory is here today. We've already invited Jesus and the Holy Spirit and God to be here today. It is in this realm. You're worth it to God. 
Ichabod is not stamped on your soul on its forehead. Jesus Christ is not departing from you today. He is here right now. He's ready to set his temple up in you. Are you ready to receive it? Have you taken it for granted? Have you backslidden in your life? It doesn't matter how beautiful you are on the outside. God is only interested in what he sees on the inside. Because beautiful evil will be destroyed. Look with me in verse number 2. It says, but he answered them, you see all these, do you not? Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Follow me on this. Not one stone will be left not thrown down. Every stone in that temple has been judged unworthy. Not because of its outward appearance, but because of what dwells inside. And it will not be set on the temple mound anymore. It will be turned over, pushed it under, and it will fall down into the chasm below. Do you see the picture here? So many would look at this and say, wow, I never saw it like this. There's so much to be found in God's Word. Do you read it? Do you know it? Do you understand it? Jesus is making it clear that he has come to replace, not merely reform the temple, to re replace it. He was the Messiah who came to save his people, and he is still the Messiah who is coming to save his people today. He has not changed. He has not wavered. His love has not dropped one degree. His love has increased more and more as the population grows. His love expands more. There's always room at the cross for you. You'll hear many preachers that actually preach the word. They're starting to be fewer and fewer. And they'll say these things. Billy Graham says it the best. There's room at the cross for you. That's the best Billy Graham I got. But it's not original to Billy Graham. It's only original to Christ. See, at the foot of the cross, it's a level field. The wealthy, the poor, the desperate, the destitute, the famous and the unknown are all equal at the cross. But God will destroy beautiful things. Ephesians 4, 29 says, Let no corruption talk come out of your mouth. Ooh. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Folks, think back this last week. What's your language been like? Now, I'm going to tell you, I get tired of hearing it. And I know right now in the upstate of South Carolina, there's going to be a preacher smoking a big old cigar today at his church with a pint. And during his sermon... He'll use words that I can't even dream about or think of because I can't pronounce them anymore. To reach people that he says, well, this is the only way you're going to reach these people. Jesus didn't use it to reach them. You don't either. It says, let no corrupting cult come out of your mouth, but only such as good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear what occasion he's talking about? The occasion of being in front of anyone, meaning we in every occasion should edify those in front of us to build up, not tear down. Folks, we don't need people tearing us down. The world's already trying to do it. Those who say that our friends are talking behind us, behind our back, they're already tearing enough down. We as Christians are here to build up not only just one another, not only God's church, but the lost. We are here to edify, not use corrupting talk, not to use filthy looker, but to use something that God gave us, an overwhelming fountain of love. Matthew 12, 36 says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they said or speak. Every careless word. I can't even imagine the things I said as a teenager. And I'm going to give an account for that. 
Thank goodness for the forgiving grace of our Lord and Savior. Can you imagine going back to your teenage years? See, that's how far I have to go back to imagine the corrupting talk that came out of my mouth. But listen, for many of us, we're still talking like that today. And it's not just talking about curse words. It's talking about any corrupt thing that tears someone down instead of building them up. Why is it so hard for us to build up? but so easy to tear down. Proverbs 18, 21 says, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. Which fruit are you going to be eating? Life or death? I particularly like life. Krispy Kreme makes a good one. But folks, the building will be brought down no matter what. Not just the buildings of this world, but the buildings and the stones sitting in the church when they are not of God. All things are lawful. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians 10, 23. I'm going to be speaking on something that's really unpopular, especially for Christians. All things are unlawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. In order to edify both him and himself, Paul rejects things which do not help his spiritual life and weaken his testimony. And embraces those which do. So if there's anything in his life, because we're all called to be just as Paul. If there's anything in his life that would cause his testimony to be weakened, that would not strengthen someone else, he got rid of it. He urges the Corinthians to do the same just as he urges us today. Bearing in mind the conscience of other Christians and the lost. So that as not to offend their consciences, some things must be rejected which are not a question of conscience or okay to do, but to the rejecter personally that would weaken others that see or hear. I'm going to give you my personal testimony of why I don't drink. Oh, pastor, don't talk about that from the pulpit. You want to talk about that? There'll be some people out at restaurants today doing that right after you get done preaching. I'm going to tell you why I don't drink. And it's not because I'm a pastor. I don't drink because I don't want to weaken my testimony. I don't curse because I don't want to weaken my testimony. I don't go to places I shouldn't go because I don't want to weaken my testimony. Not so the stranger doesn't see me, but so my family, my children, and my church, and my God doesn't see me do something to weaken my testimony that would cause someone else to slip and fall in their walk of faith. I would rather have a millstone cast around my neck and throw down to the bottom depths of the ocean than to do something that I feel is okay that would cause another to stumble. Pastor, are you saying we shouldn't drink? I'm saying you shouldn't let anything in your life that weakens your testimony that you can't go witness to somebody else. And you should be prepared to give your testimony 24-7. And if your testimony causes you to weaken someone else, then you need to work on your testimony. If you see someone struggling with lying, don't go around lying to them because they're like, well, they're a lot stronger Christian than I am. They're lying, so I guess I can lie. Having problems with filthy language coming out of their mouth? Well, if they're going around and they're talking like that and I work with him when we go to church together and, and he's a deacon because the pastor doesn't know he talks like this when he's at work. I guess it's okay. So we are just going to help them weaken their testimony and walk away from Christ. Well, a few tables down, I mean, that's a Sunday school teacher. Four bottles on the table. If it's okay for him, I guess it's okay for me. Well, Pastor, you've made me feel uncomfortable. Well, call Paul up in heaven and see how it made him feel when God told him to. Look 
because leaders will be brought down in James 1 26 if anyone thinks he is religious does not bridle his tongue and but deceives the heart this person religion is worthless Leviticus 14, 45 says, He shall therefore tear down the house, its stones and its timbers, and all the plaster of the house, just like what happened to the temple, and he shall take them outside the city into an unclean place because they are not worthy to be in the presence of the Most High. So what are we to gather from this? These beautiful, sinful temples were destroyed not because they were doing anything wrong, but because of what was happening in them was wrong. The things that were being said, the things that were being done, and the unlawful things of God that were being honored inside and outside the temple had to be destroyed. The temple and the people itself were professing one thing and living another. First Peter Chapter 2 says, you also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ. Every one of us in here today has been called to a priesthood of ministry for God's church. And it's up to you to decide, are you going to be a weak stone or a strong stone? Because 1 Corinthians 3 simply says, do you not know, listen folks, you're going to get out early because I close with this. Do you not know that God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? I ask you that question today. I ask you the same question that he asked. Do you not know that God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, that's the Christian, that's us, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. I showed you a picture earlier, and I showed you a video of God destroying a temple that was supposed to be holy. They allowed it to become everything but holy. Started off with good intentions, but it ended in, in destruction. So, folks, what kind of temple are you for the Lord today? Let me read this second verse to you. But he answered them, You see all these? Do you not? Truly, I say to you, listen up, hearken up. Jesus is speaking. Truly, I say to you, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. In the end, you will either be a temple holy, set apart from this world for God, or a stone of deception cast down because you're not worthy to be in the presence of the Most High. The choice today is the same it's always been. It's yours while the choice can be made now. Let us pray, Father. We saw here today that the men could hear Jesus, but they just could not see in their eyes that this temple was going to be torn down. And Lord, I pray for someone here today the hearing for the first time, or maybe the first time hearing of many, but the first time realizing that they finally see what it means to be a temple of God. Father, I pray that you would touch hearts today. Father, I pray that you would touch marriages today. I pray that you would touch relationships with sons and daughters and friends and co-workers. Lord, there may even be people in this church today that can't stand to be in the presence of someone else. God, this is a church not only for all, but a church for healing. Touch those relationships. Touch that husband. Touch that wife. Touch that son. Touch that daughter. But most importantly, God, touch that heart that the temple may be made holy. 
Lord, I pray people would take advantage of our altar today. It's not the wood, it's not the carpet, it's not the cushion that makes it holy. It's the presence of God that makes it holy. I pray if there's someone here today that would allow others to come and pray in their stead, they would come pray for that family, that person. Maybe for the first time in a long time, a husband grabs a wife's hand or a wife grabs a husband's hand and they just come and spend some time at the altar together. We'll go to the mountains. We'll go to the beach. We'll go to the lake. We'll just go out to eat. When's the last time you just spent some time together at an altar? Married, couples, single. Allow time with God today. If you would, please stand. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. We hope that you are encouraged by today's message. Please be sure to like and follow us on Facebook at FBC Barnwell for important updates. To give online, please visit our website at www.fbcbarnwell.org. Tithes and offerings are also accepted in the church office located at 161 Allen Street or via the Postal Service by mailing your donation to the address on the screen. Remember this week to keep putting God first in all that you do.